So welcome to the basement of my messy office in the basement of my permanent Canadian home um, where I'm testing out a brand new camera just got for Christmas. I don't have any lights. I don't have any tools other than other than the camera and my laptop. So we'll see how this uh, how this video works out. The following video, video essay is highly influenced by the book, The Corporation, The Pathological Pursuit of Profit and Power, written by Joel Bakken in 2005. And it's a written adaptation of a film by the same name. Can't recommend it more highly. If you want to hear an argument even more cogent than the one I'm going to present, then I recommend that you read it. The human spirit is an amazing thing. Individually, we are capable of incredible feats of strength, speed, and given time, enormous, glorious creativity. Collectively, our communities are able to supersede our greatest imagination, building the wonders of the pyramids before even written history, or in modernity, operating metropolises of such staggering complexity that our combined computing power can't track the myriad of activity pumping through the streets and alleys. But it is exactly this ability for our communities to create like gods, yet our individual ability to understand like ants that creates our greatest horrors. We are far more able to understand, manipulate, and or split the atom than we are able to foresee the existential crisis this power unleashed in our world and the world of our children. Just as Dr. Frankenstein was unable to see the horrors he was creating until at least he looked into the monster's eyes, so too humanity is unable to see the outcome of our effort. We only awake to our nightmare when, as Prometheus, we're trapped helpless before the endless torture that we have created. One of our greatest threats, another gargantuan yet mindless monster, was first unleashed upon the world 177 years ago. The corporation is now the world's most powerful institution and one of our greatest inventions. It harnesses and directs most of our productive global effort, yet this unthinking psychopathic machine enslaves much of our human energy to its service, strips our planet bare of its resources, turning masses of natural wealth into so much plastic, clogging our oceans. It traps us in inhuman 50-hour work weeks so we can earn enough credits to purchase whatever goods it has produced, while also deprives us of free clean air, clean water, and the productive land that should be our birthrights. Yet we still prostrate ourselves at the door of these monsters and beg to be enslaved, or weep and gnash our teeth when we are discarded in yet another cost-cutting purge. We remain hopelessly enamored by these corporations, our monstrous children. As Illich writes, when these, our tools, exceeded the size where we as individuals can understand or control, they stopped being our tools and they became our despots. So, how did we get here? And what exactly is this monster we serve? Please stick around for episode number 28 of the Pernicious Chattel channel as we take a deep dive into the nature of the modern corporation. Origins of a Modern Monster the birth of the modern corporation took place inauspiciously in 1856. In this year, and after much debate, the English Parliament entrenched limited liability into corporate law. Earlier, the British Crown might allow the formation of a corporation for an expensive specific project like railroads or canals. However, these corporations usually only attracted wealthy individuals as investors. The corporation and the investor were not separate, and the risk would be too high for the average investors. The U.S. also extended limited liability for corporations over the next couple of decades. Limited liability protects the shareholders of a com company from the obligations of the company beyond the value of their shares. Within decades, the corporation also took on its other essential attribute. Quote, by the end of the 19th century, through a bizarre legal alchemy, courts had fully transformed the corporation into a person. 
with its own identity, separate from the flesh and blood people who were its owners and managers and empowered like a real person to conduct business in its own name, acquire assets, employ workers, pay taxes, and go to court to assert its rights and defend its actions. The corporate person had taken the place, at least in law, of the real people who owned the corporation. Now viewed as an entity, not imaginary or fictitious, but real, not artificial, but natural, as it was described by one law professor in 1911, the corporation has been reconceived as a free and independent being." Close quote. And so the Frankenstein monster was born. This was truly momentous. Not only, not only because of the awful forces that were unleashed, but also because European law, courts, and parliaments had, for centuries, resisted the corporate form and limited liability. Our ancestors knew a fact that somehow we've become unconscious to. Limiting liability allows owners to shed responsibility for the actions unleashed by their capital. As the corporation developed between the 19th century and the early 20th, the, these monsters grew massively in wealth, in absolute size, and in power. The Great Depression and the New Deal drove a set of reforms that reduced the power and influence of corporations in the 1930s. However, that was reversed with the emergence of neoliberalism and neoliberal leaders in the late 1970s and early 80s. The ascendancy of the corporation was guaranteed with the success of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and the expansion of global free trade that allowed many world-spanning corporations to be free from the effective regulation of any national government. Many corporations now eclipse most governments in absolute power. Frankenstein's personality. The modern corporation is an expression of human selfishness in its purest form. Its only reason for being, both legally and in business theory, is to generate wealth for shareholders. In this pursuit, a corporation will do whatever possible to achieve this goal. Regulations and laws may be followed, at least when getting caught is likely, and usually by letter, if not by spirit. But ethics are completely irrelevant. We often hear about corporate social responsibility, charity, and business ethics. We see this endlessly in advertisements, in newspaper stories, and on illuminated billboards lighting our homeward commute. At least we think to ourselves, some companies are trying to do better in the world. Some are giving back to their community. Sure, BP is evil. But look at Google with its mission statement, don't be evil. But if we take just a little time to investigate, we will find ourselves once again disappointed. Read the press releases on corporate social responsibility. You will find statements about doing good, contributing to the community, and you will also find statements referring to corporate sustainability. Corporate sustainability means literally, if we don't do this thing, then our long-term outlook as a company is threatened. Good old Milton Friedman is his usually brutally honest when he clarifies, quote, it's like putting a good looking girl in front of an automobile to sell an automobile. That's not in order to promote poker tube. That's in order to sell cars. Good intentions like good looking girls can sell cars. It's true, Friedman acknowledges that this purely strategic view of social responsibility reduces lofty ideals to hypocritical window dressing. But hypocrisy is virtuous when it serves the bottom line. Moral virtue is immoral when it does not. The reality is, even if individual managers want to be socially responsible and want to be good, they can't. Corporate law requires managers must act in the best interests of the corporation. Quote, the best interests of the corporation's principle, now a fixture in corporate law of most countries, compels corporate decision makers to always act in the best interest of the corporation and hence its owners. The law forbids any other motivation for their actions. 
whether to assist workers improve the environment or help consumers save money. They can do these things with their own money as private citizens, but as corporate officials, however, stewards of other people's money, they have no legal authority to pursue such goals as ends in themselves, only as a means to serve the corporation's own interests, which generally means to maximize the wealth of shareholders. Corporate social responsibility is thus illegal, at least when it's genuine. Close quote. As you can imagine, if you are an ethical person and your own values compel you to act in the interests of other people, then working for a corporation will put you in a difficult bind. Bakken recounts the story of Anita Roddick, the original owner and entrepreneur behind the body shop. She was a very famous business person because she built the body shop with her environmental and ethical values built in. However, as the body shop grew, gained financing through going public and subsequently was forced to accept more shareholder involvement, these values were forced out of the business. Roddick's experience illustrates that moral concerns and altruistic desires will succumb to the corporation's goals. Quote, corporations and the culture they create do more than just stifle good deeds. They nurture and often demand bad ones. Roddick has clearly expressed this view. The language of business is not the language of the soul or the language of humanity. It's a language of indifference. It's a language of separation, of secrecy, of hierarchy. It is fashioning a schizophrenia in many of us." Close quote. The Monster's Motivations The reality of the modern corporation is that their profit at its core is not about value creation. Corporations are rather cost externalizing machines. They gather a lot of profit through pushing the real costs onto society, the environment, and workers. I'd refer to the work of E.F. Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful, a study of economics as if people mattered. In the book, Schumacher explains how most businesses account for the use of natural resources land, water, air, as well as fossil fuels, minerals, and metals as input costs when they have to pay for them, and don't account for them at all when they're freely available. In his view, this is bad accounting. When a business uses up its limited, its limited resources, whether by polluting clean water or, or dirtying clean air, or burning a finite resource like oil, they aren't just paying the cost to purchase these goods. In fact, they're using up the capital that is available to humanity. When we keep using these things, as we do, we will eventually run out. Any reasonably competent business, businessman will tell you that a business that burns through capital is a business on the brink of failure. It is ultimately an un unprofitable and unsustainable business. Yet we allow corporations and their owners to become massively wealthy from the activity, which doesn't really make sense. What we are really doing is transferring the natural wealth of the planet that belongs to all living beings on the planet into the hands of a small group. In economics, this is known as external costs. Bakken calls corporations externalizing machines. That is that their profits are generated only by forcing cross onto others to bear. Without externalizing these costs, they either become unprofitable or at least far less profitable. This includes the workers, where they are automatically paid less than the value of their labor. If their labor didn't produce a product valued more than their salary plus other costs, then there is no profit. Economists will argue that this isn't a value valid point because without the company and the company's activity, the individual's labor has no value. Their labor value is only created once the capitalist becomes involved. Yet at the same time, corporations have shown that they are willing to abandon workers by moving production to countries without worker production where they can benefit from horrifyingly abusive conditions and only have to pay a pittance. In other words, regardless of average humans benefit in some way from being used, 
that extraction will continue to the maximum allowed. To quote from Noam Chomsky, quote, if you can get human beings to become tools like that, it is more efficient by some measure of efficiency, a measure which is based on dehumanization. You have to dehumanize it. That's part of the system, close quote. Again, mistreatment of workers is an example of externality. The workers pay the cost, the company reaps the profits. The monster spreads havoc. For anyone who doubts the destructive power of monstrous corporations, let's take a very small audit of the aftermath. Bhopal, India. Union Carbide, now owned by Dow Chemicals, operated a plant in Bhopal, India, a city of 894,000 people in 1984. Union Carbide was an American-owned company and held a majority stake in UC India. After the demand for pesticides that the factory produced had fallen, the plant, now storing large amounts of dangerous chemicals, began to be the target of numerous cutbacks by UC. Cutbacks caused the loss of experienced staff, the shutdown of safety equipment, general poor maintenance, and eventually accidents that killed workers. Union Carbide US had sent in safety inspectors who found a huge number of major safety issues, 61 in total. The, issue was, the issues were not addressed and the plant continued to operate. Sometime around midnight, December 2nd of 1984, a malfunctioning tank overheated and released about 40 tons of methyl isocyanate into the atmosphere. The resulting cloud exposed people in the surrounding city to the highly toxic gas, resulting in an estimated 8,000 people dead and more than 35,000 people injured, with 3,000 or more suffering permanent injuries. Union Carbide blames the accident on sabotage, although no evidence of sabotage existed. A few local managers were criminally tried, but, but served extremely short periods of time in jail. Repeated attempts to extradite the U.S. CEO of Union Carbide to India for trial were refused by the U.S. The CEO, Warren Anderson, was never held accountable for the inaction and complete lack of accountability of the corporation he ran and he retired wealthy in 1986. Defective at any speed. In 1969, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration received a report of defective Chevrolet engine mounts. When contacted, General Motors, General Motors reported that they had already received 172 reports of failed motor mounts with 63 accidents and 18 injuries. Astonishingly, instead of taking action, both GM and the NHTSA kept quiet for nearly three years before publicly acknowledging the issue. When these mounts failed, the engine would collapse onto the frame and cause an unintended acceleration. GM did nothing until the media became aware of the issue and GM had to recall 6.5 million vehicles. In 1971, Ford launched the Pinto, a successful, small, for the time, car that sold almost 400,000 units in its first year. Unfortunately for buyers, a fuel tank issue could result in fires or explosions in an accident. A leaked 1973 memo indicated that not only did Ford know that the issue existed and how to fix it, but the, that the fix, costing about $11 per car, was more expensive in total than any estimated legal liabilities from accidents. So Ford, surprise, surprise, decided not fix fixing was more efficient and almost 900 people died before anything was done. In 2012, after denying unintended acceleration in several Toyota and Lexus models, and despite mounting evidence, Toyota agreed to pay the US government 1.2 billion to avoid prosecution. Like any other major recall, Toyota first tried to blame the driver error. Then it suggested that the floor mats were somehow impeding the return of the gas pedal while the company was hiding documents that showed a flaw in the gas pedal assembly was the culprit. 
Toyota first came under fire in 2009 when authorities released an audio recording of a 911 call from a California Highway Patrol officer, Mark Saylor, whose Lexus had begun to accelerate on its own. The car reached speeds of 125 miles an hour before Saylor crashed, killing all four occupants. Three years later, Toya, Toyota admitted that it had misled the public and recalled 9.3 million vehicles worldwide. Then there is GE, one of the largest, oldest, and most successful of U.S. corporations, a corporation that likes to tell us that it brings good things to life. Multinational Monitor compiled the following list of liabilities and fines incurred between 1990 and 2001. 1990. PCB contamination in soil and water, cleanup ordered. Discrimination against employees for whistleblowing safety violations, fine $20,000. PCB contamination of water, cleanup ordered. Defrauding government in defense contracts, $30 million awarded. Pollution at silicone production plant, $175,000 fine. 1991, improperly tested aircraft parts, $1 million in damages awarded. 1992, design flaws in parts for nuclear power plants, $80 million in damages. Worker safety violations, PCB handling, $11,000 in fines. Worker safety uh, violations in nuclear plants, $20,000 fine. Design flaws in nuclear power plants, $65 million in damages. Money laundering, illegal sales of jets to Israel, $70 million in fines. Plane crash, $1.8 million in fines. Deceptive advertising, $175,000 in damages. Overcharging on contracts, $567,000 in damages. Damages awarded as a result of a treatment given to whistleblower related to the Israeli jets, $13,400,000 in damages. Damages awarded as a result of dumping of dangerous chemicals, $96 million. 1993, ordered to clean up a mining site. Ordered to pay fishermen as a result of PCB water pollution, $7 million. Compensation order as a result of illegal advertising, $3.5 million. 1994, uh, GE settles with town over defective nuclear plant, undisclosed amount. Ordered to clean up river pollution. Fine for overcharging of defense contracts. Again, $20 million. Fine for water pollution, $1.5 million. 1995, fine for groundwater pollution, uh, pollution $137,000. 1996, guilty of breaking the Clean Water Act, $60,000 fine. Ordered to clean up soil and groundwater. Settlement of an airplane crash, $15 million. 1997, ordered to clean up contamination of groundwater and rebuild public water supply. 1998, fine for pollution, $234,000. Again, fine for pollution, another $204,000. Ordered to pay for a be asbestos cleanup, 2 billion British pounds. Ordered to pay for groundwater cleanup. Another order for pollution cleanup. That would be three so far in 1998. 1999, unfair debt collection practices, $147 million reimbursed. Ordered to clean up groundwater, again. Ordered to build new public drinking water system after PCB pollution, again. Ordered to pay for PCB cleanup of a river. 2000, ordered to pay cleanup of polluted soil. 2001, overcharging on mortgage insurance, ordered to pay $4 million in restitution. 2001, deceptive practices ruling. Whew! So these charges are limited to only the US, UK, and Puerto Rico, while GE operates in 130 countries worldwide. So let's just say that this isn't comprehensive and obviously doesn't include the instances where they were not caught. This is a rec record of a reputable corporation in a single decade, a decade where the corporation had over $80 billion in revenue. So who says crime doesn't pay?
depends on the crime and it depends on the criminal. Bakken explains these horrifying tendencies as follows, quote, The corporation's unique structure is largely to blame for the fact that illegalities are endemic. By design, the corporation, the, by design, the corporate form generally protects human beings who own and run corporations from legal liability, leaving the corporation the main target of criminal prosecution. Shareholders cannot be held liable for crimes committed by the corporation. Directors are traditionally protected by the fact they have no direct involvement. Executives are protected by the law's unwillingness to find them liable for companies' illegal actions unless they can be proven to have been directing minds behind those actions. Such proof is impossible to, to produce in most cases because decisions normally result from numerous and diffuse individuals' inputs and because courts tend to attribute conduct to the corporate person rather than to the actual people who run the corporation. The corporation itself is thus the most viable target for prosecution in most cases, and because it has no soul to be damned and no body to be kicked, punishing the corporation often has little impact." Close quote. So crimes, misdemeanors, and other abuses continue to happen, and the law is, more or less, impotent to stop it. The Monster in Democracy In order to complete his attack on the character of corporations, Bakan points out how increasingly corporations are undermining the practice of democracy and how they are actively attacking the, sp the spirit of human freedom. Corporations are considered under the law to be persons, and as a result, corporations are allowed to participate in the dem democratic process. They can act to pressure or influence government through lobbying, through direct funding of campaigns, through providing research and expert advice. Aside from the fact that their importance to the economy makes their interests often appealing to governments implicitly. This is worrying as it is well documented how corporations actively undermine effective democracy. But corporations also attempt to influence, if not control, the general public directly. Neoliberals tout the idea that through the market and the power of our spending, individuals in our society have the ability to drive corporations to do what we want. This is why capitalism equals freedom. But this argument begins to unravel when we closely examine the marketing activities of companies, especially the massive amounts of advertising that is directed at children. Quote, Kids are amazing when they watch TV, marvels, Hughes. They're paying attention to the advertising. How many people actually pay attention to the advertising? Among parents, it's probably quite thin, quite small. Targeting children makes a lot of sense from a marketing perspective as it allows advertisers to bypass media-savvy parents and engage the considerable persuasive power children wield over their parents. Children are also easier to manipulate than adults. Lucy Hughes and her industry colleagues would likely agree with the experts that young children are particularly susceptible to media manipulation. That, as the American Academy of Pediatrics states, Young children under eight years of age, developmentally, are unable to understand the intent of advertisements and, in fact, accept advertising claims as true. Indeed, the youngest viewers, up to age eight, cannot distinguish advertising from regular television programming. For marketers and the corporations that they work for, children's susceptibility to advertising is exactly what makes them such appealing targets." Close quote. What Bakken is making clear is that theoretically, we're all free to do whatever we want, but corporations are targeting us using whatever means at their disposal, regardless of ethics, to make sure that what we want is what they are selling. We can argue about the effects of corporate marketing activities, but one thing is clear. Their intent is to absolutely take away our freedom of choice. The corporation is a psychopath monster. If the corporation is an individual by law, then it seems perfectly reasonable to consider behavior as if these creations were actually an individual. One of the psychopathy assessments available 
is the Levinson self-reporting questionnaire. So I ran corporate behavior through that assessment and here were my, were my results. Scores range from one being low to five being high. The results state, your score from primary psychopathy has been calculated as 4.6. Primary psychopathy is the affective aspects of psychopathy, a lack of empathy for other people and tolerance for antisocial orientations. Your score from secondary psychopathy has been calculated as 3.1. Secondary psychopathy is the antisocial aspects of psychopathy, rule-breaking, and the lack of effort towards socially rewarded behavior. With two scores, results of the LSRP are very suitable for being plotted. Below is the distribution of how other people who have taken this test have scored. You, the corporation, score for primary psychopathy was higher than 95.74% of people who have taken the test. So that would put you in the top 5% of the total population in terms of psychopathy. And you, the corporation, score for secondary psychopathy was higher than 74.8%. 9% of people who have taken the same test, again, in the top quarter. To use simplified language, your average corporation is a nasty, craven, destructive psychopath with unbelievable power and resources, and we've granted it not only the right of existence, but we've welcomed it into our community, sometimes even offering it tax breaks and other incentives to be our neighbors or possibly even our bosses. When you look at the key characteristics of a psychopath, it is hardly surprising why the psychopathy score is so high. Bakan writes the following, quote, When we asked Dr. Hare, a prominent expert on psychopaths, to apply his diagnostic checklist of psychopathic traits to the corporation's institutional character, he found there was a close match. The corporation is irresponsible, Dr. Hare said, because in an attempt to satisfy the corporate goal, everybody else is put at risk. Corporations try to manipulate everything, including pub public opinion, and they are grandiose, always insisting that we're number one, we're the best. A lack of empathy and asocial tendencies are also key characteristics of the corporation, says Hare. Their behavior indicates they don't really concern themselves with their victims, and corporations often re refuse to accept responsibility for their own actions and are unable to feel remorse. If corporations get caught breaking the law, they pay big fines and they continue doing what they did before anyway. And in fact, in many cases, the fines and penalties paid by the corporation are trivial to the profits that they rake in. Finally, according to Dr. Hare, corporations relate to others superficially. Their whole goal is to present themselves to the public in a way that is appealing to the public, but in fact may not be representative of what the organization is really like. Human psychopaths are notorious for their ability to use charm as a mask and to hide their dangerously self-obsessed personalities. For corporations, social responsibility may play the same role. Though it can present themselves as compassionate and concerned about others when, in fact, they lack the ability to care about anyone or anything but themselves." Close quotes. These points are not really revolutionary. With a brief amount of consideration, they seem pretty self-evident. The only surprise is that the majority of people accept corporate behavior. The majority excuse this behavior. A large group encourage this behavior, and no corporation, no group of shareholders, and almost no manager is ever held responsible. Our Frankenstein, our Frankenstein isn't met by a group of villagers holding pitchforks, rather by a group of whores offering free blowjobs. Corporate Frankenstein an uncertain future, just as our Frankenstein monster is ugly and unintentionally, mindlessly dangerous, so too our corporate monster has demonstrated its blindly destructive character. The creation of the corporation allowed for a powerfully additive explosion of economic growth. 
But this amazing invention has also unleashed a powerfully destructive and abusive force on the world. Whether through poor treatment of workers, environmental destruction, undermining legitimate governments, immoral or even criminal behavior, or through creation of these massive communities that by law and by practice demand psychopathic behavior. As it would rapidly approach the environmental point of no return, where global warming will become a runaway process charging towards Armageddon, we can no longer afford to organize ourselves this way. Nor can we really afford to allow these institutional behemoths to stomp about unsupervised like giant ADD toddlers. Luckily for us, the modern corporation is not some independent organic entity. Corporations were created through the incremental decisions of governments. The corporate person and the virtual impunity of limited liability were granted by legislative provisions. Just as governments have given, governments can take away. But this is not an especially optimistic fact. What government would be willing to go first, knowing the controversy that they would face. The hostile pushback from the international community. This is a world dominated by pro-corporate forces, the WTO, the World Bank. Most national governments and most supranational organizations, regardless of political label, are primarily bastions of neoliberalism. Corporations may not be organic, but far too few people see them as optional. In the original book, Frankenstein, our mad scientist Victor succumbs to the mental and physical exhaustion while his monster lives on. In the 1931 movie, the monster appears to die a fiery death, but Victor lives on, injured, traumatized, but alive. These two endings are entirely appropriate for our own monster, the modern corporation. It is within our capacity as a species and as a society to tame these beasts, or if untamable, to simply end their existence. But it won't be easy. The political will doesn't exist among leaders or among the general public. So the ending to our monster story remains completely unknown. We may die just like the literary victor, exhausted and defeated by a creation, or we may yet gain freedom, like, our, like the cinematic victor. Either way, this story will end conclusively and within the foreseeable future. If you enjoyed this video, I would be like super duper honored to receive your like and a subscription. This is XCG wishing all of you an easy downward jog on your journey to freedom.